He needs no introduction. No, no, but there's a real, very important thing. Jay is amazing, and I can say that because it says right here. <laughs> he stutters if he doesn't wear pants. <laughs> he has to imagine while he's up here that everyone else has no pants. He has a Reason for Reason podcast series, ladies and gentlemen. Jay Dye. Oh, oh, here, give me all this stuff. There you go. You might discover something. Excellent. Oh, that you can sell on the internet. We've got that up there. Hello, everyone. Hello. And uh, ha also, Happy New Year, everyone. Happy so, New Year. So my, uh, my very skeptical New Year's resolution is to continually remind myself to, to be vigilant about the fact that despite overwhelming evidence, not everyone is a fan of Taylor Swift. <laughs> now, I was actually going to do an entire talk about Taylor Swift denial, but that was vetoed by our organizers, so I'll guarantee you that there will be other Taylor Swift-oriented skeptical things going on later in 2015. But for today, I'm going to talk about uh, a more common New Year's resolution, which is uh, getting fit. So my name is Jay Diamond, and I, uh, I write a blog on the Skeptic Inc. Um, uh, network on the Healthy Skepticism channel called Vitamin J, and it's about um, skeptical bodybuilding and evidence-based fitness. So it's interesting to note that pseudoscience is prevalent in the fitness industry. It's even worse in bodybuilding. And um, it turns out that science, evidence, critical thinking, hard work, can be applied to allow you to live better for longer. And I think you'll come to understand by the end of my talk that that is not actually an extraordinary claim. Let's see if this works. Come on. So I need to start with a disclaimer. So first off, I'm not a doctor, nor do I pretend to be one. Before you attempt any physical activity, talk to a doctor. Not a witch doctor, not a chiropractor. <laughs> Not a, an acupuncturist, like a real doctor that's been to medical school, understands science, blah, blah, blah. Um, so also, don't take my word for anything I'm going to say. Um, you, like any good skeptic, you should go off and research it yourself. Um, my blog actually has uh, uh, a lot of uh, additional references if you're curious about anything that I have to say. Go. All right, so I am here to skeptically pump you up. All right. So I'm going to talk about a few things today. The first is fitness denial. Uh, the next is an approach to fitness with an eye on skepticism. I'm going to try and dispel the myth that you do not have enough time to work out. I'm going to talk about supplements a little bit. And then I'm going to give you the ultimate answer to building muscle. So. Stay tuned, it's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> okay, so when I first started talking about fitness, um, I kept coming across people who seemed to have a problem with this idea that physical activity actually improves health. Now, I didn't think that that was an extraordinary claim. And these people would have, well, no, you, you laugh, but like, let's actually examine this. Do you really know that there's evidence behind a causal connection between physical activity and health. Now, one of the main reasons that a lot of people um, that would, would deny this link would give me was pretty clear they didn't want to work out. <laughs> I understand that. That makes sense to me. So I actually went off and I did a little research. So it turns out when you do your research, you find out that, um, yes, they're very clearly, definitively, unequivocally is a causal relationship. But it turns out we've really only known that for about 60 years. And that was fascinating to me. To put this in perspective, Jack LaLanne, fitness guru Jack LaLanne, opened up his original fitness studio in Oakland, California in 1936. That was more than a decade before we actually had evidence that physical activity was good for your health. So he was running off anecdotes. Okay. 
when this was really found was when a doctor in the UK, Jerry Morris, um, post-World War II, decided to try and figure out why the rates of, of heart attacks were going up in the UK. And so he did a little uh, examination of the data around people that worked on double-decker buses. So there's two guys that work on the bus. There's the driver, who sits on his ass all day, and there's the ticket taker, who runs all up and down the bus, all around the bus. He's always doing stuff. And what, uh, what Dr. Morris found was that the guy that was running around all day actually had a much lower incident of heart disease. Well, that's interesting. So like any good scientist, he went off and he replicated it. And he looked at people that work uh, as mail carriers and mail clerks and found the same thing. Now, this is being replicated all around the world in all kinds of different facets. And so that causal relationship between physical activity and improved health is something that is very clear today. But let's take a step back for a second and talk about kind of a general framework for understanding fitness as a skeptic. So this guy, the governator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, is what most people think of as a bodybuilder. And you can understand why. He's huge, he's well-defined, he's ripped. That's a bodybuilder, right? So about three years ago, I uh, was at the Amazing Meeting, the biggest gathering of skeptics you've heard a few other people talk about, um, in Las Vegas. And one of the great things about that meeting is you get to sit down with people from all around the world. Well, I'm sitting down with a woman who starts to tell me this really interesting story. So she's quite heavy set, having a little trouble walking, and she tells me about her doctor giving her the news a year or two before that she was going to be in a wheelchair. And her reaction to that news was, to hell with that, I'm not going to be in a wheelchair. So she set about methodically <coughs> trying to improve her physical condition. So she started losing weight, she started building her muscle, she started working out. Now, she doesn't look like the governor, but this woman is a bodybuilder. And I come across people all the time that I would classify as bodybuilders. So in terms of definition, you need to broaden that scope. For me, five years ago, I went from being in the worst shape of my life, as a guy who had never really been in great shape, to today being in the best shape of my life. And now I'm in a state where every single day of my life, I'm in the best shape of my life. When I die, I'm going to be in the best shape of my life that day. <laughs> so, the, one of the funny misconceptions that I had about fitness when I started this journey was that guys like this had lucky genes. And it was really all about lucky genes. That he was born pretty much like this and went to the gym because he could. Now, I don't know, that, that, may, seem, that may seem ridiculous. So that, is, that is truly what I believe. Now, it turns out genes do play an important role. But so does hard work. Hard work um, really means that anyone can exceed their, uh, their wildest fitness goals. Now, on this, on this journey, I've discovered a bunch of interesting things about the similarities between science and bodybuilding. So the first is that there are lots of misconceptions. I'm sorry, there's a, there's a leopard rolling around on the ground <laughs> named Susan. Um, so there are lots of misconceptions about both. Uh, it turns out that success in both requires incredible hard work. And once you've gone through the path of all of that hard work, um, the results can often be quite surprising. So one of, the, one of the, the complaints that I hear all the time about people not wanting to work out is that they don't have enough time. So let's, let's address that one head on. So you're all sitting down, right? Yeah. OK. What if I told you <laughs> that you could exercise less than 10 minutes a week, not a day, 10 minutes a week, and get the same results as six hours. What would you say? No. No. No, right? You'd be bad, bad use like, of six hours. Sorry? Bad use of six hours. Bad use of six hours. <laughs> so that is an extraordinary claim by any man. 
Um, it turns out that science shows this is true. Now, you're not going to like that 10 minutes. <laughs> but, but it turns out, it turns out that's absolutely true. So let's, let's look at some science volumes. So let's, took a, let's look at two groups. So the first one does 90 to 120 minutes of, of moderate cardio three times a week. So that's four and a half to six hours. Okay. Group two, they're going to do 20 to 30 seconds full out. They're going to rest three to four minutes, they're going to do that half a dozen times, and they're going to repeat that three times a week. So that is six to nine minutes of workout per week. After a couple of weeks, as measured by time tests and muscle biopsies, pretty much identical results. Wow. Okay? Now that's remarkable. This is um, something called high intensity interval training. And it is science. Now that's being replicated in all kinds of ways by a lot of different people. It's real. Now, all that said, when I say identical results, it's not exactly identical results. It depends how you measure your results. So, if, um, uh, if one of your goals <coughs> is to lose weight, weight maintenance, if I do six hours of cardio, I'm going to burn a lot more calories than 30 seconds of anything. Okay? So that's, that's one important part. Some people just like getting into the zen of working out. They like building up the sweat, they like getting into the rhythm, as opposed to the high intensity interval training where for uh, a number of intervals, you think you're going to die. <laughs> and you think I'm kidding, but this is one of the reasons that I don't do this. First off, I don't like the sensation of dying. <laughs> and second of all, I'm really good at cheating. <laughs> what I'll end up doing is not working out to my absolute limit, but rather kind of working out a little harder and then say, you know what? There we go. I've done high intensity <laughs> interval training. I really would have done if I just cheated. Okay? So, um, so the takeaway from this is there really is no excuse <clears throat> that you don't have enough time to work out. You've always got enough time. You may just not like what that means. <laughs> So then, let me talk about supplements. Um, there are a lot of extraordinary claims in the marketplace around supplements you may have seen. So let me go through a few of these. So these are common ones that I pulled. I didn't want to actually show ads to embarrass any companies. So the first one is uh, improved flavor. That means it tastes terrible. <laughs> but it used to taste worse. Um, one you see all the time in bodybuilding circles is build muscle fast. Now that means eat lots of this supplement and work out really, really hard and maybe you'll build muscle. And the last one is get ripped quick, which basically means do all the stuff of the last one. So eat lots of the supplement, work out really, really hard, and don't eat anything else. <laughs> because the definition you get with the bodybuilders looking really ripped comes from being very lean. So, how do you really go about making sense of this wild arena of supplements? Let me give you a bit of a, um, a, a, bit of a, a rule set for this. These, these are the rules that I use. So the first one is do no harm. So, there are, for example, supplements that have been on the market that are stimulants that can have all kinds of adverse effects um, around uh, coronary incidents that have been taken off the market. Um, as you start to examine potential supplements, just first make sure that there aren't a lot of bad things going on in the marketplace. The next one is proven efficacy. So um, in a perfect world, I want to see a double-blinded test, large randomized trials um, to tell me that something has a real effect. Now, if it's a smaller test, and maybe not quite as well constructed, I'll still pay attention to it, but it doesn't hold the same, the same evidence, and I'll, I'll wait for a much larger test. And the last one is experience. I have to be able to experience this thing, and it has to be germane to my goals. So if, um, uh, if I can't, I, I don't have an infinite amount of time and an infinite amount of money to try every supplement on the market. So I want to be choosy about this. So if I know that something is going to have an effect that I care about, I'm more likely to take it. 
So, a general rule for supplements is that um, the science has become pretty clear. Most supplements really do nothing for people. <laughs> so unless you have a deficiency, or unless you have a special need, there's generally no reason to take most supplements. And if you listen to some prominent skeptics in their podcasts, guys like Stephen Novella, guys like Brian Dunning, you will hear them say on their <coughs> podcasts, if you eat a good, healthy diet, you get all the nutrients you need. And that's absolutely true unless you have a deficiency or unless you have a special need. It turns out one of those special needs is the desire to build muscle. And so I'm going to talk about one supplement, really the only supplement that I recommend to people. And that is protein. <laughs> so when I first told my doctor that I was taking protein supplements, his response to me was, well, you know, that's not really a supplement. That's really more of a diet choice. Turns out protein is food. <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's one thing to... Um, uh, to actually just ingest your food, but do you actually need to supplement the protein that you eat? Well, let's, let me go through that set of rules and apply it to protein. So, the first one is do no harm. The potential risks that I've heard associated with protein, protein supplements specifically, are kidney and heart disease and allergies. Well, at, different people are allergic to different things, um, there's all different kinds of protein supplements. I had a trainer who was a vegan. He took soy protein. There's a lot of different solutions for, for uh, allergies. Um, it turns out digesting food is hard on your kidneys. So digesting more food is harder on your kidneys. Um, so again, if you have uh, kidney disease or if you have potential problems with your kidneys, you should be careful about taking this stuff. But that's not most people. And the last one is heart disease, where the bigger issue with heart disease and protein isn't actually the protein, but it's the things that come along with it. If you eat a lot of red meat, for example, you're getting fat and cholesterol, and that's, that's a potential problem if taken in big quantities. So for most people, um, the risks on that one are really <coughs> low. The next one is proven efficacy. And on this one, the evidence is super clear. There's really little doubt on the part of doctors that protein builds muscle. The bigger question is how much protein to take. And so then the question is really dosage. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. And the last one is experience. And from my experience, when I started taking protein supplements, so I started working out, uh, my, my initial goal was just not to die. Once I knew I wasn't going to die, I started doing weight training. And after I'd done weight training for about six months, I started taking protein supplements. And almost immediately, I started seeing increased muscle mass. Because having the right fuel, it turns out, builds muscle. Um, the unintended consequence that I didn't expect was it pushed a lot of other things out of my diet. So I stopped eating a lot of crap because I was taking this supplement. Because you actually feel more full when you take protein supplements. Now, that said, um, this last category, the experience, is completely anecdotal and should be weighed as something that's substantially less important than the first two. But coupled with the first two, it, it's another, another screen for me. So let's talk a little bit about um, how much protein to take. So if you talk to bodybuilders over the last four decades, they'll all tell you the same thing. It's a standard rule of thumb. It's one gram of protein per pound of body weight. That's every day, whether you work out or not. And by the way, that's a lot of protein. We'll go through exactly how much protein that is in a minute. But um, it's a really odd way of analyzing this, because grams is in metric, <laughs> and pounds is an imperial. What are the odds that those would line up perfectly? It's kind of unbelievable. Well, it turns out it is unbelievable. And the science is actually pretty clear that it's more like 0.75 or 0.8 grams per pound of body weight. If you take more than that, it really doesn't seem to do you much good. And um, it could potentially do you harm. It does make your, your kidneys work harder. It's... You have to digest all that extra stuff. So, so there could be uh, detrimental effects if you take a lot more than that. 
Um, but I would have friends that would say to me, okay, great, so I get that, that's science. You know what, I like eggs. Can I just eat lots of eggs and I'm good to go? I, I like chicken, can I just have a couple of chicken breasts a day and I'm good to go? Well, let's do the math. I, when I first started going through this, I didn't know what the answer to this was. And I had never really seen it broken out this way, so I did a little analysis. Well, if you look at a large chicken breast, it's about 200 grams of, uh, it's about 200 grams. 20% of that is protein, so that's about 40 grams of protein, okay? Um, for a large egg, serving size about 50 grams, that's 6 grams of protein, okay? Um, let's look at some, some, uh, some example people here. So, that's me, I'm about 175 pounds, so I need about 140 grams of protein a day. Well, that means I need two dozen eggs a day to get that protein. <laughs> <Love it. Wow. laughs> or about three and a half large chicken breasts. Now, to give you an idea, when I was working out two, two and a half hours, four times a week in the gym and burning thousands of calories, I would go home and I would have, I would have a protein shake and then I'd have a couple of chicken breasts and I was stuffed. So the idea of eating three and a half a day is insane. <laughs> Two dozen eggs is insane, right? Nobody can do that. Now the other thing is, you get a lot of other stuff that comes along with the ride when you eat that much food. With the eggs and the chicken breast, you're getting a lot of um, sodium, you're getting a lot of cholesterol, you're getting a lot of fat. And that stuff that you should be much more worried about than taking the protein. So having a refined protein supplement is actually a useful thing to achieving these goals, if one of your if one of your targets is really to um, uh, to uh, to put on muscle, so now I'm going to give you the uh, the ultimate secret to building muscle. Okay, you're you're mostly sitting down. That's good. So this is something that every trainer I talk to says, well, of course, and. I didn't have a clue, and a lot of people I know that don't work out don't have a clue. Um, if you want to test your limits on a motorcycle, you're going down and you're going to have a road rash. If you want to test your limits in a relationship, that's going to wind up in a murder-suicide. <laughs> that's not going to be good. So a lot of aspects of life, failure is not a good thing. Now it turns out that there's a growing body of evidence in uh, the areas of things like psychology, in management science, that look at the value of failure. It turns out you can learn a lot more from failure than you can from success sometimes. And that's absolutely true with bodybuilding. <laughs> so as an example, if you go to do an easy workout where you never fail, it turns out you're really not building much muscle because the body adapts. The body figures out how to, how to get that done in the easiest possible way. Now, the body adapts. So, if I work out to the point of failure, the body has to figure out how to handle that. Now, when I say to the point of failure, I'll give you an example. If you pick your favorite exercise, if you want to build your arms and you're doing bicep curls, um, you t the, the way this is typically measured is there are a number of different um, um, repetitive versions you do and mm. exercise, reps. And you couple those into sets. So you might do three sets of 10 reps each. So you start with no weight. You get your form down. You start building up the weight. If you can do three sets of 10 successfully, that's not really building muscle. So you keep going to the point where you start failing. So you might get to the point where you have enough weight, where you're doing 10 on the first set, 8 on the second set, 6 on the next set. And then you come back the next day and you try it again. So you, let's be clear, you failed. You did not hit three sets of ten, okay? You suck, okay? You come back the next day. You might get ten, ten, and eight. Well, it's still not quite, you know, you still kind of suck. So you come back the next day, and eventually you're going to get three sets of ten. And then you bump up the weight and you start failing again. It turns out, really, the secret to building muscle is failure. You have to take it to the point of failure. And so, in bodybuilding, failure is success, and that's how you put on muscle. Mm. 
So, summing up everything you've learned today, evidence proves that fitness improves your health. There is no such thing as not enough time. You need a lot more protein than you think, but not as much as most bodybuilders think. And now that you know how important failure is, I want you to all go out there and fail. <laughs>
physical education. He'd been an instructor. And he gave a talk recently. And he was saying that when people get older, uh, they have to really they take it easy on this stuff because they, they showed that studies showed that they uh, the ones that do sustain more long-term exercises, moderate, have much more success avoiding heart disease than burst stuff. Yeah. When you're young, I think you can handle it. So I think if, if you keep, um, if, if you're active your whole life, certainly it's going to have a better outcome for you. I don't think there's any question there. Um, it's interesting for me because I really didn't become physically fit until my 40s. And I have many friends who were very athletic in their 20s. And they've all got parts that have worn out. They've all got replacements. For me, it's all new. <laughs> which, which, which has an interesting side effect, right? It tells me that it's never too late to start, mm -hmm. right? I shouldn't, or you shouldn't start early. <laughs> <laughs> you should start. Well, let me be clear. Had I started at 20, had I known what I know now, what I know then, what I know now, yeah, I'd be, uh, I'd be uh, twice as ripped by now. And the follow-up to that is uh, talk to your doctor before you start yes. the program. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to your doctor before you. Did, did I mention that I had a disclaimer? <laughs> Good. All right. Thank you very much. All right.